what is the thing in life that you value most? When I've heard that question asked and answered throughout all of my life, uh, the most common response is that is, is some kind of relationship, whether that relationship is a spouse, a child of children, friend, maybe a, a combination of any of those. And it really speaks to us as human beings because at, at our core necessity for each and every one of us is relationship, is intimacy, connection, community. And it actually goes back uh, to something we see at the beginning of Scripture in the creation story. Adam is placed by God in the garden, and he, he walks in perfect relationship with God. He has all the animals around. And the first problem we see is God noticing that it's not good for man to be alone. Even though Adam has, th- has uh, this un, uh, uninterrupted relationship with God, he needs to be in relationship with someone of his own kind. And it's the truth for each and every one of us. We, at our core, need and desire relationship. And today, we're continuing our series, Lavish. We're continuing a series where we look at the lavish gifts of God, how he is a generous God. He's given us so much. And today, we're really looking at what gift has he given that answers the need for relationship. And to do that, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. We're going to be covering really a lot of ground. We're going to be covering quite a bit of scripture. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're looking at this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And in it, he's addressing quite a bit of uh, ish, quite, a, uh, quite many issues uh, that the church is experiencing. He's calling them to something greater. Uh, and in the midst of chapter 12, he's really writing to them about God's design for the church. He's writing to them about God's design for the church. And so we're going to go uh, to first to verse 14. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized in, into one body. Jews are Greek, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So here's Paul. He's writing to the church in Corinth. He's reminding them of who they are, who they were, and who they are now, that they are this this body, this church body that has been created by God, that Jesus Christ through his work and the, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they are one body. And he's calling a, into attention, he's highlighting the diversity of the people within this body. Uh, the, the church in Corinth was this major, or the Corinth, the city was this major port city. It had a lot of people from all over uh, the area coming together, people of different races, ethnicities, uh, prior religions, backgrounds, all of these differences. And they were all together in the city. And now they were all together in one church. And he highlights Jews are Greeks, slaves are free. In uh, different letters, he highlights men and women. Uh, this is just a multitude of people coming together. So they have Jews or Greeks, people under different uh, religious system. The Jews, of course, under uh, the law, they were followers of Yahweh. And the Greeks, they had this pantheon of gods and goddesses. They are now united. He, he mentioned slaves and freemen, uh, these people who had power uh, to do really whatever they wanted. And they had people subjugated to that power who were under the authority, complete authority in a brutal fashion of, of others. And, and talking about men and women, they had different roles and abilities to do things in society. They were under a very patriarchal uh, form of leadership. All of these people with differences are united as one. We see kind of this true melting pot happening. Uh, growing up, of course, in the American school system during history class, we would learn how America is supposed to be this picture of a melting pot. People from all over the world coming together as one. And yes, they have all their differences, different races and ethnicities and backgrounds, all becoming truly American. And I got at one point my uh, real chance to see this in action, to experience this. About 10, 15 years ago, Jamie and I, we had lived down in Long Beach, California. We were there uh, so Jamie could pursue her graduate degree. And, and I was excited to go there because it was going to be this chance to experience a very diverse culture, one that I had never had experienced before. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with L.A., and I'm really talking about L.A. County, L.A. County is approximately about 200 square miles smaller than Douglas County. But in this smaller area, uh, there are 9.8 million people, about 90 
times as many people as we have in Douglas County, packed into this relatively small area, people living uh, right on top of each other, houses butted up to houses, cities butted up to cities, just this massive amount of people uh, coming from very diverse backgrounds and races, ethnicities, cultures, living together. And it was really cool to witness these people, uh, all these different people living together. They would, they would work together, they would eat together, play together. But what I found really odd, really was unexpected, was, was that they would live separate. And what I mean by that is if you looked at East LA or the surrounding cities, Montebello, it was primarily a Hispanic community. And if you went to South LA or Central LA, Watts or the surrounding cities, Compton, Inglewood, primarily black communities, if you would go up north into the, to the foothills, Pasadena, Altadena, there were mostly white communities or Asian communities. There were over there, uh, there was Eastern European, Pacific Islanders, all these major ethnicities, races, cultures that were, yes, blended together, but they were also living separate they would all return to what is human nature. We seek companionship with people who look and share experiences. So yes, there was this, this mixing of cultures, but really the separation happening as well. And it's what's happening in Corinth at the time, what happens today. And what's beautiful that Paul's drawing attention to is that the gospel accomplishes what mankind has been trying to do through all of history. It is a true true melting pot, people coming together, living together with all their different backgrounds and, and, and living under one body, under Christ, united because of the work of Christ, united because of the indwelling of the same spirit, worshiping the same God, glorifying the same Father. It's this beautiful picture of a true melting pot of people. And he writes, and he writes about this, he uses this, this analogy of a body. At this analogy of a body with Christ in Ephesians 1, he said, Christ is the head and we comprise all of the parts of the body. He's drawing attention to this, this picture of the church. We all living as one body with all of our differences united under Christ. And he goes on, actually going back to verse four, he says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So he's writing about this, this analogy of the body. He's talking about all the different body parts. And really what he's, he's saying is all these different body parts are comprised of people, but the body parts represent different giftings and roles within the church. That each and every person has received a gifting, has a role within the church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us, my, myself, every one of you listening today, we each have a gift that the Spirit has given us. And he goes on in the following verses to list all these different gifts. He talks about knowledge and wisdom and tongues and interpretation and discernment and healing, these, these amazing gifts. And this list he gives is not meant to be ex exhaustive. There's multiple times the giftings are listed in the New Testament. Each one is different. There's some overlap. Uh, but the idea being there are numerous gifts uh, and that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, distributes them as he sees fit uh, for time and place. And so each of us have this, this gifting. And then he goes on to say, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That this gifting that the Spirit has for each individual in the church isn't for, them, for their benefit alone. It isn't just for living at the mission of Christ, but it is for the common good, that each gift exists to benefit and build up the church body. It's what Paul is writing to highlight. It's what, um, it's a passion of family church to, to mobilize each and every member of the church to live fully in their gifting for the benefit of the church. And today, uh, joining me today is Crystal Cunningham. Crystal, is our executive operations director. Uh, but Crystal didn't start out in this role. Crystal actually had a, a different role when she started at the church, really trying to live out this passion. Yeah, thank you, Drew. Yeah, about 10 years ago, I came onto the team in a role called the ministry coordinator, which actually was a huge uh, point in my life of revealing what God had been doing for a long time. I became a believer when I was 15 and almost simultaneously on that evening that I became a believer, I had this deep passion to like, 
serve the church and the gospel. And I didn't know what that meant for a long time. It was the obvious track of like, I considered Bible college and I would, um, I was just invested in a lot of ministry as a youth. I actually would sneak over from my little church in Sutherland, Oregon to family church because that wasn't where I was going at the time and listen to the preacher there. And at the time, Pastor Paul, one of our um, retired pastors was sharing a message. And that's where I decided that I am going to Bible college and I'm going to serve the church. And so I went to Bible college. My husband went to Bible college. We uh, pursued ministry after that. And it became clear that like pastoral, traditional pastoral ministry wasn't what my husband was called to. And I was a bit lost in that bigger calling, but we continued to be a part of the church. We both loved serving the church. And through being a part of family church, as we moved back to Sutherland, I was selected for the ministry coordinator role, which was really the heart of the leadership in that was to mobilize every individual to find their gift and participate in the church as God called them to, which was amazing. And I realized as I started doing that role how much I loved watching people understand how God created them and being able to figure out how they could use that where he has placed them today. And I even looked back at my story as a kid. I loved teams. I loved anything that had to do with teams. I uh, didn't care about princesses or Hallmark romances. I loved like the A-team, you know, like those military guys that all had different skills and there were a bunch of misfits that came together <laughs> to do something spectacular. I love that kind of thing. So as I was doing the ministry coordinator role and realizing this, I, I began to also see how important it was to have a healthy organization, a healthy functioning together. And I, I started to pursue uh, systems and I went back to school and got my degree in organizational leadership and business administration for the purpose of serving the church and um, creating a healthy place so that every member and every person could be empowered to do what God had created them to in a healthy dynamic. And really that's kind of full circle, the core of even what I do today. It comes back to that passion to empower each person to be living in their mission in the body of Christ, to be working as a whole. And that means that every member matters. No, that's what Paul is really writing to about this church in Corinth. He's addressing this division that's happening in the church. He's seeing how uh, they are there. There is this, this elevation of certain giftings and this devaluing of other gifting and it's hurting the church. They're not living in the fullness of what God has for them. And he's calling them back to unity. He's calling them back to valuing really every single gift. He goes on in verse 16, it says, And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. He's calling them and reminding them that regardless of their gifting, they all have an important role. What actually we see as you jump forward into, into chapter 14 is it seems the church is very highly valuing the t gift of tongues and devaluing some other gifts, in particular probably prophecy. And, and, and as they elevate these tongues, uh, a lot of the members are saying, well, I don't have that gifting, therefore I don't really have importance. I don't have a role in the church. Am I really even a part of the body? And Paul's saying, uh, of course you are. If you have a gift and you all have a gift, you are part of the body. You have a valuable role and you are, nece you are necessary. Uh, and it's what was happening back then. And unfortunately, what has been happening really through all the history of the church, um, we even see it sometimes today. What, what happens is, the church becomes synonymous with the Sunday gathering. Uh, and at the Sunday gathering, a very important part of church living, what happens on the Sunday gathering is there are a couple of roles, a couple of giftings that are elevated uh, simply because of how it happens. Uh, in particular, if you can speak, if you can play an instrument, if you can sing, you have a really defined role and purpose for the, for the church body during that hour. Uh, but if you don't have those giftings, a lot of people, a lot of times are just left going, well, what, what role, what purpose do I have within the church? Uh, they're saying, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not the mouth, so what, I'm an ear. What good is that? I guess I'm not part of this. Uh, and so what we, what we desire, what the God desires is each person to recognize, yes, you are made differently. You are empowered differently, and that's valuable to the church. You can't exclude yourself. Uh, and so he goes on. He says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? He's saying uh, the, the Spirit hands out all these giftings with a purpose. He doesn't want everyone to receive the same gifting. I mean, just think about it here. Now, at our local churches, every single person was gifted with the ability to speak or teach. Uh, we would be missing out greatly. We need so many other gifts. Uh, the church service is just one hour a week. Uh, there are so many hours left for the church to live in its fullness that... Uh, 
I, I just imagine if everybody had the same gifting, it would just be chaos. We don't need a thousand speakers. We need, uh, we need people with different giftings to build each other up during the entirety of the week during, while we do all the different things in our lives. Uh, and really what's beautiful about all of this is Paul's writing the church. He's explaining that they uh, have received this beautiful gift of the church, but he's also reminding them that they themselves through the power of the Holy Spirit are a gift to one another. And that's uh, really something that we need to live in uh, fully, this, this belief that I am a gift to you and you all are a gift to me. Yeah, and I think this is a hard thing to do. Just like the Corinthian culture, it's it's hard to overcome the culture's pressure to uplift things that are flashy, to not seek power and influence or things that echo that. We do have a strong celebrity culture. And that's something that we have to intentionally push back on. And Paul gives some great instructions to the Corinthians that is apt for us as well. He says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are undis- indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and are unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. So back to that first part, on the contrary, the parts that seem to be weaker and indispensable, those parts of even our physical body that may seem weaker or we have to put extra care into, those parts are important. They're valuable. They're indispensable to our whole health. And just like that in our family and our church body, we have to make sure to uplift those that maybe don't get seen as quickly and those who we don't think to value them because they're not up front or they're not in a flashy um, position or their skills aren't the things that the culture might see as valuable. And that means looking to those who um, around you and, and reminding yourself that they are important and to yourself that what you do, the way you care, the way that God has created you to love those around you is an indispensable part of the body just as everyone else is. And I feel like I got to live this out in a very intimate way in the beginning of my faith journey. I was brought into a family as a young believer. They saw my need for a a Christian family. I didn't really have much in the way of domestic um, life. And so they brought me into their family and I was able to see how their family interacted. And, and Dan, who was the dad, he was the one that really brought me into the family. And he was a very gregarious individual. He was very extroverted and loving. And he had been a pastor by trade. He had a gift in teaching. He was a great counselor. He could lead up front. He could lead in lots of ways. But what I got to see and being part of his family is how him and his wife interacted. And his wife was very different in her gifting. She was very uh, quiet She was uh, very um, slow to speak, and she was very much interested in helping from behind the scenes. And I got to see how she provided a place of love and care for people to come into in a very quiet and um, and, and sweet way. I saw how Dan would find respite and being with her because of her different giftings and his, how she had discernment. And I saw how Dan chose to uplift those gifts in her, how he chose to listen to her, how he chose to keep in pace with her so that they could be unified. And that not only made them a more um, synced married couple, which is great, but they were brothers and sisters in Christ. And both of them felt very passionate about loving God and loving others. And they did that so well together because of the way they cared for one another and the way Dan cared for Carol so she could care for his gifts as well. And in the body of Christ, that's why we have to do this, why God calls us. Um, to make sure that we keep in pace, that we keep unity, that we consider all giftings and all people and see their value because that's how we get unity. He says that there, this is because that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. Looking back at that Corinthians 12, 25. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We are connected when one member is taken care of, the rest benefit from that. And the same way, when one member suffers, we are missing out on what God has provided, the gift he's provided through them. So before we get into the rest of Paul's instruction, where he really digs into what this looks like and what's what's the core piece of how we live this out intentionally, there's this verse that I think, Drew, is a bit problematic. It's hard to understand. <laughs> so yeah, this uh, this verse actually is, causes a lot of disagreement. In its interpretation it actually has led to some what I believe some really uh, troubling uh, troubling theology. And so, at verse twenty eight through thirty one, he says, "In God is appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues." So he writes this list, and he he starts off first, second, third, and that uh, creates some question: Is he writing this uh, listing them in order of importance? 
our value? Is he writing them uh, chronologically? And we're going to actually just hold on to that and come back to it in just a second. He goes on. He writes some questions. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? He's asking all these questions, and they're all rhetorical questions with the implied answer of no. Of course, not ev- not everyone is all of these things. Uh, drawing back to what he's written earlier, everyone is gifted differently by the Holy Spirit. But then he makes this really interesting statement, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. He seems to be referencing back to this list. Uh, and the problem a lot of the times comes if we just take this specific part out of context. Of course, it's written as a whole letter. Uh, we add the chapters in later. So when we look ahead forward to chapter 14, what we see is he starts to talk about this more in depth. He's talking again about their elevation of tongues and their devaluing of certain gifts, likely prophecy. And he starts to say, you know, tongues has a specific role. It is a very valuable gift, uh, but tongues are for the unbeliever. Tongues are to build up oneself. And then he highlights prophecy and he says prophecy is a gift for, uh, for the believers and it is for the building up of the church. And so what he's reminding them is that they are to value all gifts, but to value all their gifts in their proper role. So as he's talking about the church and building up the church, the tongues has a role, but it's not that specific in that specific context. There are different gifts for the building up of the church and that they need to desire those and stop really repressing them, stop pushing them down and highlighting one gift out of the context it's supposed to be used. Um, But then he goes out of that and he kind of draws them back. He says, I will show you still a more excellent way. Yeah, right in the middle of this passage where he's uh, directing these church that's wayward in the way that they're treating one another and living out God's mission. He has this character building, character teaching right smack in the middle, because that is where the core of living this out in a way that glorifies God is. This is chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians. Most of you have heard it. It's the superlative of love in our culture. It's used in secular culture and weddings and and movies. It's a great explanation of love, but we can't forget that it is truly an instruction to a church who needed to be corrected and disciplined and brought back in to the way God intended them to live with one another. And the core of the being able to fight culture, to be able to fight the flesh, and love one another with humility and in a way that brings unity is love. And as he says in this passage, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but we have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Do you like clanging cymbals? I do not like clanging cymbals at all. No, they don't get you excited or feel beautiful. They get my kids excited, yeah. but not me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, no, they they might put on a flashy show, but they're not, it's not a good identification to be a clanging cymbal. And if I have a prophetic, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith, all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Those are pretty lofty things. Faith that can move mountains knowledge of all the mysteries. Yeah, that's that's big stuff. But without love, he says, those are nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own ways. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We can be flashy. We can be successful. We can do all kinds of things. But we are, if we are not loving God and loving those around us, we are not fulfilling what God has created us to do here on earth. And this is, a, this is an aspect of character that we can't create or live out fully without Him. It really does start with God. He is, he is love. This is inherently who he is, his character. He showed us love beyond comprehension by not um, Jesus himself, not taking equality with God, something to be grasped, but becoming as a man to this lowly earth, living amongst us and giving his life so that we could have this access to love. And even as Jesus lived out his time here on earth and the mission of God, he very intentionally lifted up the lesser than He could have went to the affluent. He could have went to the powerful, but he picked those that were were the unspeakables, the, those who no one would have thought would have any type of impact on the world. He brought them in to the greatest story. And I think that's God just embodying and, and um, showing us love in action. And that's what we are called to. And here is why. Going on to the next passage, love never ends. 
As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesize in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. Love does not end. Our relationship with God, our relationship with others will not end. These gifts and skills that we have are good. They're for the building up for the body in this in-between place that's imperfect, but they will not go on. They are not who we are, but we need to embody and embrace them so that we can love one another with them. And I would just want to challenge you. I want to challenge myself to really think through what this looks like in my life. And I want to go back to those verses, uh, starting in four of chapter 13 of this little teaching, this characteristics of what love looks like in action, what it looks like in our hearts, that it's patient, that it's kind, that it does not envy. These are things that we can use as diagnostic when we are looking at how we live in relationship with others, how our hearts are, are filtering what's going on inside of us and take that back and let God into that space. And I think it's twofold being able to do this, not only seeking to live that out in your relationships, but it starts with embracing God's love for you. And I think this is where the enemy disables the church first. I know it's where he does. I know in my own life, it's it's the lies that I'm not good enough, that my gifts are, are not going to make a difference, that maybe I'm not gifted. You know, there's lies that contradict God's word, that maybe maybe I don't have anything to offer. Even preparing for this message this week, Drew, I don't usually do this. This isn't my role. Um, and I, I think of all the things that I've done half well, and I don't do well. And I think, why do these people want to listen to me on this topic? But this, I'm qualified because of the Spirit of God, because we are the church, and this is His Word, and He's placed and given me the opportunity, and I'm just here to love and to share that love. And each one of you, just like Drew and I, you are equipped, you are called. God has designed you to love the people around you, to love the church, and your gifts matter. We need you. We need to do this together to to press into what God has called each one of us to do so that we can fulfill His mission together and build one another up. And so from Drew and I, we just want to say we love, we value you, and we're going to pass back to the campuses so you can talk more about this. Um, Thanks for sticking around today. For our transformational moment, we have a couple of questions for you. The first one is, how is the the church a gift to you? What has the church, the people of God, how have they blessed your life? How have they built you up? What have they really done for you in your life at Really, how has God worked through his people uh, for the benefit of your life, your family's life? And the second question we have is just like it. How are you a gift to the church? What skills, what giftings has the Spirit uh, given to you, enabled in you, so that you can uh, help the church reach maturity, so that it can be built up? Uh, what giftings do you have? And I guess really a wrestling with, are you fully utilizing those giftings? Yeah. For sure. And then also we want to just encourage you to to seek unity with us. We're going to do like an exercise in this as a church body. We put together just some prayer prompts and a rhythm of prayer for the month of December. And we'd like to consider to join us in this. We'll put a link up to that PDF that you can access. It'll also be in our app and on our website. And we just want you to pray with us. It's the first step is coming to God together and, and focusing on Him so that we can love one another better 